Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things, cause it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible. Through you, blind eyes are open, strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. Your promise still stands, great is 
like to invite our prayer partners off to each side of the room. Uh, if there's anyone out there that just wants to go before the Lord in prayer and have that agreement just coming before his throne, whatever your need may be, big or small, we encourage you to step out from your seat and find one of those prayer partners.
God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All the glory, every victory. Sing that out over your own life and situation. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome. We will overcome by the blood. The word of our testimony, everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, everyone overcome. Oh! 
Come on, church. Can we give God praise? Can we lift up the name of Jesus? Come on, church. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day about this concept here, and every one of you, you have a story. You have an or, a story of something that you've overcome in your life, a story of something you've been through and everything else. And here's the, the problem in the world that we face today is many times you'll, you'll tell your story, you'll tell it several times, whatever. You'll, you'll get to the point, you'll be like, I just don't want to you know, bother folks, or I don't want to be repetitive with my story and, and just talk about my story all the time. But Scripture tells us that we are saved by the blood of the Lamb and the what? And the word of our testimony. Let me tell you something, church. Don't ever believe the lie that you need to be quiet about your story or his story. Amen, church? Come on, let's give God praise. Don't ever believe the lie that you need to just be quiet about yours because, well, I've talked about what I faced with cancer, or I've talked about what I faced with what I went through, or I talked about what we went through in this so many times. People don't want to hear it anymore. People need to hear what you've been through. People need to hear what you have faced in your life and they because they see Jesus in that story. And so church, let me just encourage you because there are, there are people in this place today who have believed that lie. And let me tell you right now, don't believe it. Don't believe the enemy. The devil is a liar. Amen, church? Believe what God, what story he has given you, and you let the world know it. Can you pray with me today? How many of y'all needed that reminder in this house? Come on. I needed it too. I needed it too. Lord, we just lift our hands to you and praise God because you have given us a story to tell. A story of redemption, a story of favor, a story of going through pain and everything and finding you on the other end of all of what we went through. And some of us are maybe even going through it right now. But let us not believe the lie from the enemy that we shouldn't tell that story, that we shouldn't talk about what, what you, the story you have given us, that our story is valuable and it's important and the world needs to hear it. And the biggest mistake we'll make as Christians is being quiet and becoming complacent and just being okay with just blending in with everybody else. We weren't meant to blend in, God. We were meant to stand out for you. And God, I pray that we take our story wherever we go and we know that just as this song says, your word says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So I pray for that encouragement for all our folks. There's things going on in their lives right now, but God, I pray that they stand up and they stand out and they tell that story to others in need. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus. God is good. Amen, church. Tell your story. Why don't you turn to somebody today, welcome them to church, and tell them, man, my God is a good God, all right? Ashley and welcome to CLC. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. We want to take just a minute and show you some ways that you can connect here at CLC. If you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. In our upper foyer, we have a red connection table with a gift waiting on you. So feel free to come up at any time and we'd love to connect. Hey, come join us for our Wednesday night services on Encounter Nights. We have something for everybody and the whole family. We have something for the adults, kids classes, youth, and um, support classes. We're so excited to have and share for y'all. Listen, on Encounter Nights, we are concerned with two things. That's encountering God and encountering people. These are the greatest two commandments that Jesus gave us. So it's so important to connect with the body of Christ. So we really encourage you, come out, join us on Wednesday night, get connected with God, what God's doing. Doing here. We're so excited to have you. If you're new to CLC, feel no obligation to give. But if you're looking for a giving opportunity, you can give in three different ways. Drop off your giving at one of our boxes on the second and third floor. Give online at clclayton.org slash giving. Or text to give, text CLC to 73256. Thanks for all you're doing here at CLC. 
Thanks for being here with us today at Christian Life Center. Here's a few more ways you can stay connected. One, you can download the CLC Layton app. Just search CLC Layton on your app store. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram by searching at CLC Utah. And we also would love for you to download the Church Center app. By downloading the Church Center app and searching for Christian Life Center, you can find all of our life groups, events, and signups for a lot of things that are happening here at CLC. It helps you stay even more connected. We know this morning God has an important word for you today. So thank you for joining us and being a part. God bless and have a blessed day. All right, church. How many of you guys excited to be here in church today? Can we give God praise? All right, hold on to your communion because we are doing communion today. We're just doing it at the end of the message today. And so we're going to participate in that in a little while. So just hold on to that today and we'll be taking communion at the end of message as part of what we're doing. Uh, but in the meantime, can I have Matthew Becker come up on the stage and join me today? Some of y'all in the church know Matthew. Matthew's been here for several years. Um, and uh, Matthew and his family are going to be moving up north. Um, and part of one of the things that we... Uh, Always struggle with the church is having to say goodbye to family and friends. And Matthew has been a friendly face and a, and a wonderful heart and a great servant and so many things. And where are you moving to, Matthew? Minnesota. He's moving to Minnesota. So I thought it was cold here, but wow. All right. Praise God, man. May you provide extra sweaters for my brother right now. Um, but hey, Matthew, anything you want to share real quickly just about, about this church or about your experience here or anything else? Yeah. I appreciate everything that you guys have done for me over the years. You guys have I've been so much of a family to me, and I appreciate everything you've done. I'm going to miss every one of you guys. I'm going to miss helping out in the children's church day and during vacation Bible school. I'm going to miss singing here because uh, it's just so much fun. I was I missed being in the choir uh, before the uh, pandemic hit. Um, it's just been so much of a great experience being here with you guys and I'm going to miss all you guys <laughs> terribly I love you love you brother Church, would you stretch out a hand? Let's pray for Matthew today. Is we're praying for travel and mercies for their family and that they find a new church home. Um, we know that as the body of Christ, we we are not disconnected from this point anymore. Amen. He'll be able to watch the messages online. And while we do value that and treasure that, we believe that when a family moves to a new area, that it is incredibly important for them to find a family to get connected in and others. They need to be in the church, amen? Um, they need that connection with others. And so let's pray for that for Matthew. Lord, we love you. We honor you. We give you praise. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in Matthew's life. And God, we uh, thank you for this opportunity you provided for him. God, he doesn't even know what's on the other side of this, but he didn't know whenever he arrived here at CLC about how blessed that he would truly be. And so, God, I pray that you would just remind him that on the other side of new situations and new adventures, you're still there. You're still there and you're still available. And so, God, would I, would I just pray you provide for him and help him in this. And, God, we thank you for with the blessing he has been to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give a hand for this guy. He's a great guy. Two more things. God only knows, and God is a way maker. He is a way maker. Hey, love you, brother. Absolutely. Hey. Matthew's a good dude. Hey, thank you so much. Tia, could you come on out here? And uh, Tia is going to be sharing with you some stuff. Can we get a big hand for Tia Wilson? Hi, guys. Good morning. Um, I have a few announcements to make for women's ministry. Um, who doesn't love shopping and not going to the store to shop? You guys all already come to church, so instead of going out and fighting the crowds in the mall, the craziness of finding a parking spot, why don't you do your shopping here? We have some fall crafts for sale starting next Sunday. Um, all the proceeds are going to go to helping different ministries operate here at CLC, but also helping several families with Christmas this season. And in a few weeks, we'll have Christmas items, so you can come get your fall crafts, make your house look nice and cozy for Thanksgiving, and then get your Christmas gifts, and it's for a good cause. Um, my next announcement, coming this Saturday, we have Women's Equip Conference. I am so, yeah, you can cheer for that. I'm so excited for conference. This conference is all about helping women equip themselves with um, real life tools they can use from a Christian perspective. So we are gonna have classes from dating and singleness, godly parenting, godly meditation, health and fitness. Um, I'm so excited. It is a free conference, which I'm so 
excited to be a part of a church that is saying, yes, let's invest in our women and host a free women's conference. So please sign up. You can sign up on the Church Center app or in the front office. Um, it is free, but please register so we know how many people to plan for. That would just make my life so much better the next week. Um, but yeah, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. we're going to have breakfast, coffee, and a time of fellowship, and then classes and breakout session starts at 9 a.m. Lastly, what is my last one? Oh, we're going to have our annual Women's Christmas Brunch coming up on December 3rd. So make sure, women, this time of year gets crazy busy. So get your calendar out, put it in your phone now. December 3rd, we're going to have our Women's Brunch celebrate Christmas all together at Warehouse 22. It'll be so much fun. Need and Eden will be there. Um, I'll have to find a cute little Christmas outfit. Taylor's so excited about that. But, um... <laughs> Yes, Warehouse 22, December 3rd. Get it in your calendar, Women's Brunch. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. So have a good Sunday, and I think Rob has a few more announcements. All right, hey, can we give a hand for Tia? I had Tia come and do that because, one, she's fantastic. Um, and, uh, and two, there's just something a little bit you're going to more remember about those announcements because I was going to come up here and just be like, hey, there's a conference. They want you to shop and then Christmas stuff. All right, women, do your thing, all right? That's all I was going to do, Mom. Um, so she just made it way better than I did. So, you know, women, check out these events. It's, it's truly incredible. A um, couple other things. One, Primetime Live, our seniors ministry, uh, that is actually going to be having the 50 and up. Uh, that is Red Lobster Lunch today. Make sure you join them for lunch at Red Lobster today. Um, also, another thing you can get together and eat because we love getting together to eat. Amen, church. All right. What else will we do, right? Um, uh, we're going to be doing our men's breakfast this coming Saturday. Where's my brother Waddell? Waddell's out there, man. He is a great leader and great guy. If you've never been to men's breakfast, one of our guys, seriously, you got to come this Saturday at 8 a.m. This is the 5th of November. Make sure you check that out. Uh, it's going to be an awesome time. We meet downstairs in our international kitchen. And then finally, one last thing. Hey, yesterday, Love My City and Trunk or Treat was absolutely amazing. We had so many volunteers. How many of y'all hands raised out there? Can you turn up the house lights for me a little bit so I can see um, the hands out here? How many uh, hands are raised out there that are going? Man, so many. Can we give a hand for all these volunteers that made it happen? We had... Nearly 500 kids and probably nearly 1,000 people all together that came through Love My City and all of that. We fed 150 families. We blessed a lot. There were people who were led to Christ. There were awesome uh, conversations and everything. And let me just tell you real quick, make sure you guys pick up these. The, uh, we had in third place for the, for the contest... Um, Bob's Burgers and Lilo and Stitch. So that's Annie and Cal and Brooke and these guys, Annie and these guys, they got third place. Second place was Super Mario. Where's, where are my people at? Shantae and her family. And then in first place actually was Jason and Kelly. Starbucks over here, all right. They did a great job, but there were so many really good ones that were incredible. Make sure you check them out. I will tell you one last thing with Love My City is we go immediately from that into the next thing. And that means we're working on Thanksgiving food drive right now that starts today. Here's a couple of ways you can help. One, you can go pick up a turkey or whatever. We can start taking turkeys anytime this week. We can start taking items anytime this week. But if you don't wanna to go to the store, we can make this super simple. Today, right after church, come see me at the coffee bar. Everybody say coffee bar. Okay, come see me at the coffee bar and you can either give cash you can give a check or you can pay by card. And if you give $40, that provides us the money to be able to go buy a meal for a family. $40 to provide a meal, including turkey and the sides. $15 provides just the side bag. So if there's anything you want to do, you can come see me, line up. Let's provide for our families. Let's make sure that no family goes without Thanksgiving this year. And you wouldn't believe how many actually do. So thank you for being a blessing. Thank you for being a great church. Love you guys. God bless. Have a great day. Awesome. All right. Well, there's a lot going on, and the needs are great. <clears throat> I don't know why I need to say this, but I don't want you stressing out on the giving. Do what you can do, but you've got enough stress. We are going to continue to do everything we can to help people, okay? But just... Just don't add stress to yourself. Trust God. Do what he's telling you to do. The Bible talks to us about giving out of our heart, not out of obligations. 
I just want you to know as your pastor, I understand the climate that we're in. It's a big, big, heavy wind against us. So thank you for your giving. I assure you that if you can help out with the Thanksgiving and the other things, truly, truly, if you can do it, there will be people that will be in tears uh, over the gift that we will give them. So hang in there. It'll be all right, okay? All right, well, thank you for being with us today. And for those of you that are here for the first time in person or online, welcome. And uh, we're glad that you're joining us today. Let's pray and we'll get right into our message. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful congregation. We'll close this service today with a communion, mess, a communion uh, celebration. And I pray that in this message that it will help them even to understand why communion is so important, even though it's not a communion message per se. We love you, and we do need you, and our lives are yours. And we do often see through the glass darkly. We do our best, and we depend on the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. And when we fail, for whatever reasons, we desperately need you to pick us up and to get us back onto the right track or to find the clarity like we're going to talk about this morning. So we turn this over to you this morning to speak into all of our lives, not just to church as a group, but to us as individuals and families. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I want to mention something to you that I think is powerful. Many people have said it. Uh, Warren Buffett actually said it uh, yesterday, I think. You don't find out who's been swimming naked until the tide goes out. <laughs> Hello. If you haven't ever heard that before. You don't find out who's been swimming naked until the tide goes out. There's a lot of people in the church world that swim naked. And they look good. <clears throat> they say the right things. They raise their hands at the right times. But when trouble comes, for Pete's sake, <laughs> when, t this is serious. <laughs> when trouble comes in their life, and all of a sudden the tide goes out, we find out they've been swimming naked the whole time. All of those words of depending on Christ, trusting Him, Him being their all in all, was baloney. They were in the fellowship of Christ, in the waters of Christ, if you please, but they were swimming naked. And when God allowed the tide to be moved back, they were exposed for the hypocrisy or not so uh, harsh, immaturity. So think about that as we go through this message. This is a series on miracles. Miracles aren't flippant things that God just sort of draws a name out of a hat and says, bingo, you're the lucky winner today. Miracles are a part of God's interaction with the human race that are designed primarily for him to teach us something, to, to express a truth, while at the same time meeting a need of the human race or of a person or of a group. So think seriously about this as I share this message with you today. It's our second message, when you can't see things clearly. You need a miracle in times in your life when you can't see things clearly. Our text will be from the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. You have to understand that everything in life is affected by our perspective. Dick Foth, well known in our circles, said this, 
How you see life determines your success, your stability, your strength. It determines everything in your life, everything. How you see God, how you see your past, how you see your present, and how you see your future. How you see your strengths and weaknesses, end quote. So how you see life determines everything in your life, everything. Jesus made an important statement in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew records it, chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus is talking not just about physical sight here, but spiritual sight or eyes. What he's saying is, is that perspective is everything. Everything. It's vital to see life from God's viewpoint not ours always and certainly not the carnal man and in our text in Mark chapter 8 verses 1 to 12 we see Jesus feeding 4,000 and the Pharisees then trying to trap him by asking him doctrinal questions but Jesus wasn't going to have anything of it so we can go to our text in Mark chapter 8 And for the moment, let's just look at verse 11 and 12. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. This is just after he fed 4,000 people. A miracle. It was a miracle. And these Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply. He sighed deeply. Have you ever been in a serious situation and sometimes as it unfolds you just sigh deeply Jesus sighed deeply and he said why does this generation ask for a sign truly I tell you no signs will be given to it I don't want to get in trouble before I ever get started and I don't want you to take this general comment to too far of an extreme. But you're going to see as I go through this message, sometimes we still, today, 2,000 years later, especially in our Pentecostal movement, even go so far as to not only have conferences but services, and we're advertising signs and wonders. You're going to find in here Jesus never held such services but I'm ahead of myself doesn't mean there can't be a place for some of that but are we just like that generation demanding a sign what happened is the stability of reading God's word standing on the promises of God knowing what the Bible says and doesn't say what happened to the simplicity of Christianity that like those 2,000 years ago we demand that God give us a sign if God never did one more thing for me today and I mark this down as fact I will live for him till the day I take my dying breath I don't need another sign I don't need another wonder I just need to stand on God and his promises and that weak response is exactly why I'm preaching this message today because all across Christianity today we are drunk on our own need for God to do something in this area that that re strengthens our faith as though our faith is wobbly If you got wobbly faith this morning, you're in trouble. You're a target for Satan. So Jesus left him. And in Mark chapter 8, verse 13 through 16, 
He then left him and got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. Remember, he just fed the 4,000. Pharisees try to trap him. He has nothing to do with that. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Disciples completely missed the point. Jesus is using a metaphor for life, and they took it literally for bread. In verse number 17, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? You ever had a conversation with your teenagers after you've gone through something, and right after you thought you had this all cleared, they say something stupid? Anybody ever had that happen? They've been through all of this, and Jesus has led them through this, and then they say, oh, it's because we have no bread. And he says back in verse 17, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? The disciples just weren't getting it. Now, you need to know what I've already stated to you about miracles, about Jesus' miracles. Every miracle taught a lesson, and every miracle met a need. Every miracle taught a lesson, and every miracle met a need. It wasn't to get more, daughter, more dollars in the coffers. It wasn't to build a name. It was to teach a lesson and to meet a need. But the disciples were only seeing the physical, not the spiritual. You probably know that blindness is a metaphor for a closed mind in the Bible. In other words, the spiritually blind. So Jesus heals the blind man that we're going to talk about this morning that you've heard about, but I'm going to show you some stuff maybe you haven't seen before, and it certainly will help you. Jesus, when he heals this blind man, he's teaching us a truth, which we'll cover today, while meeting the blind man's need. So Jesus would later say, and you know this from Scripture to the Pharisees, that they were blind leaders or guides. They had all the facts and all the doctrines of the Bible, but they didn't get it. It's just like a Christian here today in any church in America or anywhere in the world, of course, but who can cite all of the religious thises and thats and thuses and say sos and they can do the King James or the NIV. They're so good at it. And yet they miss the point of everything they've put to memory. So why don't we often see clearly? Why is it because we, we love God, we go to church, we tithe, we, we volunteer, we give to those in need, we do all these things, and yet sometimes we don't see clearly why? Why don't we identify the problem in our marriage or our work? Why? Why don't we see what God is doing in our life? And I understand Paul says that in this life we see like uh, through a glass uh, darkly. It's, it's fuzzy sometimes in our own understanding he's talking about. Well, in the passage Jesus points out, and it's in your notes here, three barriers that hinder us from seeing clearly. And you have to see this because I run into it in interactions with other people. It can be personal. It can be family. It can be the church. It could be the school. It could be uh, any, any relationship. You can see these things show up with what we're kind of like Jesus saying, what? Why can't you see clearly here? And here's the reasons why. Number one is pride. Going back to our text in Mark chapter 8, but go back to verse 15. Be careful, Jesus warned them, and watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. You have to understand that yeast is often 
a metaphor for pride or arrogance. Yes, it's used as sin in general, but pride and arrogance. You put yeast in a dough, and by the way, with Marsha being down, she's able to be with us today. She's now in a boot, graduated from the cast, etc. But through all this process, I have achieved my CA license. <laughs> Chef assistant. <laughs> okay. But pride... When you put yeast in dough, it puffs it up. And too much yeast will blow it up. Did I pass? <laughs> People filled with pride and arrogance blow things up out of proportion. Let that sink in. People with pride or arrogance blows things up out of proportion. Secondly, short-term thinking is what keeps us from seeing clearly. I've tried to teach you over the years, the board and staff knows this, we can't just be short-term thinkers. We have to be long-term thinkers. But short-term thinking will mess you up. In Mark 8, 16, it says that the disciple says, it is because we have no bread. <laughs> That's short thinking. Didn't Jesus just do a miracle of feeding 4,000 people? Yeah. Pretty short thinking. Jesus was talking about life. <clears throat> the disciples think he's talking about lunch. Jesus is talking about their behavior. The disciples think he's talking about bread. Short-term thinking keeps us from seeing God's work in our lives. Short-term thinking shuts down relationships, shuts down work opportunities, shuts down marriages. You can be in a situation, let's take marriage, and it can be a serious situation. But if you don't see serious, if you don't see clearly and your pride is allowing you to blow it out of proportion, then you can blow up the marriage because of short-term thinking. We see constantly where something goes haywire and somebody overreacts and compounds the problem with their bad behavior. And then when they rewind, they say, <clears throat> that was short thinking on my side. Number three is short-term memory. One of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons we don't see clearly is we have short-term memory issues. Jesus said in our text in Mark chapter 8, verse 18, and don't you remember? And don't you remember? He had to remind them of the two miracles that they had just seen. They're worried about bread. Jesus is like, hello, I'm in the boat with you. Didn't you just see me feed those 4,000 people? What's your problem? How quickly we forget. And again, I've watched it over the years. I've watched the saints of God who through the most difficult of life ex uh, experiences have maintained their stability in Christ. That doesn't in any way suggest they didn't feel pain, anger, insecurities or challenges but they laid them all at the feet of Christ where they belong and they journeyed through them changed by the process and ultimately for the good as God works all things out for our good I've seen many others that couldn't even get past somebody sitting in their seat in church it's like are you serious we don't need a doctor's appointment. You're full of yourself. You're swimming naked. Hello? God does something good. He answers a prayer. He bails us out. He does a miracle. And yet the next time we have a problem, we act as though it had never happened. Like how could God be trustworthy? We forget. This isn't in your notes, but I highlighted it in mine with a different color. When I can't remember yesterday's blessings, 
I start fearing tomorrow's issues. Let that sink in. When I'm facing issues that can overwhelm me, and yes, I do, the first thing I do is go back and remember the blessings. I said to Marcia this morning, I said, you know, Marcia, I feel kind of like a child who needs an adult to put their arms around me and say, it'll be okay. And I'm screaming there, it's not going to be okay. You ever been there? Of course. How do you get out of that? You go back and you remember the blessings of God. He was there for you then. He'll be there for you now. We have to lay aside the prides and all these other things and focus on him. When you don't have the right perspective, you'll lose your hope and you'll probably miss that miracle that you could have had. We have to have spiritual vision. Listen to me today. If you're just an intellectual Christian, there's no heart, there's no depth, there's no maturity... You're lacking spiritual vision. You can know all of the scriptures and lack spiritual vision. Vision. So, number one, three conditions for a miracle. These are critical for you. Some of you need a miracle today. This isn't a joke. You're just wondering whether you ought to just give up the ghost and go under the water. There are three conditions for a miracle. One, miracles happen when somebody cares. Mark chapter 8, verse 22, I'll show it to you here. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Some people brought a blind man. This blind man is toast. His miracle doesn't happen except for somebody cared enough for him. He didn't come on his own. He had to be brought. There are people in this building watching online, some of your neighbors, co-workers, who need a miracle. But they're not going to get that miracle unless you care enough to bring them to a place of opportunity. The miracle doesn't depend on their prayer. The miracle won't depend on what they may or may not do in this sense. The miracle is tied to you caring. You'll be a part of their miracle is probably the best way to say that. This guy had caring friends. Number two, miracles happen when we get close to Jesus. You can't stand way over here with Jesus way over here and expect miracles to come into your life. You can't stiff arm Jesus and expect miracles to come. You can't get carnal in everything that you're doing and expect God to do a spiritual work in your life. And yes, the Bible talks about carnal Christians. Paul writes about it. If you're a carnal Christian, you're not going to get that miracle. You may need it desperately, but you're not going to get it. Mark chapter 8, verse 22, the rest of that verse, and beg Jesus to touch him. Beg Jesus to touch him. You can't touch Jesus unless you're close to him. You can't touch me from where you're at. And if you have nefarious intentions, there are armed guards around here that will take you down. If you're going to touch me, you've got to get close. If, if you need a miracle and you're going to get a miracle, you've got to get close to Jesus. Not close to the church. This isn't about the church. We come together. The Bible talks about the church or the body of Christ. The people come, but we're not about the church. We're about Jesus Christ. The church is simply a mechanism for us to come together and have the teachings and the oversights and blah, 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 blah. But we're not trying to build the church as in a building, Christian Life Center. We are building his church, or it's about Jesus. Yeah. 
miracles will not come to you through religion, rituals, rules, or regulations. As I said earlier, Jesus ne never held a healing rally. Not once. He didn't post flyers. He didn't have staging and a warm-up act. And he didn't go around showing off. Every healing that Jesus was involved in was an unplanned interruption. Number three, miracles happen when we trust Jesus to lead us. Every miracle I've experienced in my life, and I've experienced a lot of true, genuine, bona fide miracles, it's a huge part of the stability of my relationship with Christ. But as I said earlier today, and I've said many times before, once I knew, it wasn't no time till God proved himself, and I was off and running, and the devil was just in trouble. Miracles happen when we trust Jesus to lead us. Look at Mark 8, 23, in the first part. He took the blind man by the hand. I love that. Jesus took the blind man by the hand. I don't have time to go into all of it, but you know everybody else was kind of telling him, shut up, you get away, Jesus is busy or whatever. You know, I mean, it's the way people are. But if this guy doesn't allow Jesus to lead him outside the village, he doesn't receive the miracle. He took the blind man by the hand. That's as personal as it gets. My friend, you need a miracle today. You receiving my message because it's so powerfully and anointedly delivered, yada, 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 won't get you there. I can deliver the most anointed, powerful message ever delivered. And people who need a miracle will still get up out of their seats and walk right out that door no different than the day they came in. Because what they failed to do was let Jesus take them by the hand. There isn't a preacher ever been on this planet and an anointing on that preacher high enough for things to happen without a person letting Jesus take them by the hand. You just don't get there. You don't get to shore without letting Jesus take you by the hand and trust him to take you of where you cannot see. Maybe this is you today to trust Jesus to lead you. It's called the walk of faith. That's why we have a walk of faith. If you ever, you probably, many of you have never even seen it, but over by children sitting in those little tree stuff, there's a walk of faith. Different people have scriptures and their names there and special scriptures to them. It's called a walk of faith. And you can walk through them and read each of those scriptures that meant something special to people in their life. You can't see, but God can see. This miracle is a very unusual and unique miracle in many ways. It's the only time Jesus heals in such clear stages. Not bing, done, bing, done, bing, done. Yep, stages. And there's a reason for this, a progressive miracle. Of course he had a purpose for this. Mark chapter 8, verse 23, where we left off. He led him outside the village, and when he had spit on the man's eyes... That's unusual. When he had spit on the man's eyes, put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. And once more, Jesus put his hand on the man's eyes. And then the eyes, now I want you to notice this, the eyes were, number one, opened. His sight was, number two, restored. And he saw everything, number three, clearly. Those three words are important. Opened, restored, and clearly. We learn in point two here of this message three lessons about seeing life clearly. Many of your mess-ups, many of your desperate situations have come out of you not seeing life clearly, and you have gotten in your own way and made a mess of it. We need to stop that. 
How can we see life clearly? One, in your notes, my spiritual vision grows in stages. My spiritual vision grows in stages. When you go back to Mark 8, 24, he looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. We don't see everything clearly, instantly in life. We see incrementally. We see progressively. There's a combination, it's too much to get into today, of how that happens. But the reality is that we can be blind, and when our eyes are opened, we don't see everything, but we begin to see. And things still, okay, I can see some of that now, but everything still looks like trees, kind of foggy a little bit. But I'm not over here blind now. I'm beginning to see something, spiritual vision, insight, wisdom. It grows in time over stages. It's a big reason why those who are our elders in our faith are people that we can most trustworthy go to in order to find counsel and direction and wisdom. And if they are trustworthy people, as most would be, they will help us because they're seeing more clearly what right now to us is only trees kind of fady, funny things out there instead of people. And if you've been growing spiritually, you see life a lot clearer today than you did 10 years ago. And if not, you're probably not growing spiritually. You're stunted. You're stuck. And everything we do here at CLC and LCA is intentionally designed to help you grow spiritually, gradually, incrementally, and progressively. The school side more than this because of the dynamics of the international students, but not limited to that. That process is more challenging because these, many of these kids have no claims to Christianity. And we have Muslim and Jewish kids, and so it's an interesting thing. But everything we do is to get you to grow. It's why we do small groups and why Taylor is working so hard on this part of his uh, uh, ministry here on staff. Jesus wasn't satisfied with this guy's blurred vision. And he's not satisfied with us having blurred vision. Yes, we're better than we were blind. But Christians running around with blurred vision just constantly are bumping into other Christians and knocking them off into the canal there with alligators. And that Christian's looking up at you and saying, why did you just knock me over in the canal? Sorry, I didn't see you. Brittany from her first radiations. Our eyes cross over, you know how it works, left and right eyes go together. Her neurological damage from the first set, her vision is like a TV set. It's weird. Right down the middle, everything on the left, she has vision. Everything on the right is as black as a TV never turned on. So she walks with no sight from her nose to the right. And so she needs people on her right to help her, or she would accidentally walk into people, and people see her. They don't know that. They assume that she sees them and will not bump into them, but then it does, right? And then, of course, in the angry world we have, someone could very possibly then cop an attitude. I remember years ago, we were at a, at a basketball game years ago. I still had Shelly. She was a teenager, but she had mega problems. And we're in a huge rush to get up to this little rinky-dink only seating they had in this gym. And people were, I mean, it was shoulder to shoulder. And I couldn't get Shelly. She was stubborn. So, Shelly, get up the steps. And she wouldn't go, and I'm trying to help her up. And the guy right behind me just yelled at me with the most violent of anger. This is a Christian school that we're playing as well, right? And I just wasn't going to have it that day. And I turned around and said with everybody to hear, you know what, mister, I'd do that, except my child is handicapped, and I'm trying to get her to go up. And that's just how I said it, in Jesus' name. And he immediately bowed his head and said, I'm so sorry. 
and everybody around now knew, well, that was a stupid thing for that guy to say. You can judge that as you wish. I don't really care. But he learned a lesson that day. When you see with blurry things, you do damage to other people. Don't be that blurred vision Christian that does damage to other people. Okay? See what's going on. Let's move along. Number two. The test of my vision is how I see other people. The test of my vision is how I see other people. Relationships, love. Seeing others as God sees them. Everybody matters. There are no little people. There are no insignificant people. Go to backwards a couple of chapters to Mark chapter 6 and verse number 34. When Jesus landed, saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Jesus didn't see, oh, these are just a bunch of dumb people over here. I don't care what happens. He saw them all as sheep without a shepherd, and he had compassion on all of them. Spiritual vision. Seeing others as God sees. Number three, Jesus heals my sight in three ways. Jesus heals my sight in three ways. I've already given you a hint to this. Mark 8, 25 again. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and they were opened. The sight was restored. He saw everything clearly. What in the world does that mean? Let's do it in your bullet points. One, the first bullet point, my focus gets sharper. My focus gets sharper. You see the word opened? In the Greek, it means he fixed his focus. Jesus touched the man, and he fixed his focus. He saw the big picture, perspective. And I tell you, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you'll see the big picture. You know, I, I've once heard, and it's true, it's, it's spoken of in just the general truths of life, although there's obviously a biblical underpinning to it all. But how that, especially in ministry, as preachers, you know, our young people, we're going to save the world, right? We get a little bit older, and we're going to save America. We get a little bit older. We're going to save our community. We get a little older. We're going to save our family. And we get a little older. God, I got enough trouble with me. I pray we can just get through this, right? <laughs> How often that happens. When you find yourself uh, unfocused, your vision blurred, you simply need a touch from Jesus. You don't need another Bible study. You don't need to put extra money in the offering plate. You don't even need to pray a ritual prayer. You need a touch from Jesus. The second bullet point is my perspective gets larger. You see it in the word restored. My perspective gets larger. Listen to me. When Jesus is your Lord, not just your Savior, don't mean to mince words or kind of parse out words here, but we often talk about Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Theologically, I don't want to get into all that, but the practical purpose of that is they say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm saved. Okay, but if he's not your Lord, at best you're an immature believer and you're going to have all kinds of missed blessings in life, at best. So when Jesus is your Lord and he's directing your path, you begin to see beyond yourself. And it's not about me. Lord, it's about you. What do you want done? When I read Scripture, this is just me, you don't have to take this, but when I read, read the New Testament in particular, I see Christian people that could not and would not tolerate the things that I mentioned like pride in the beginning 
that keeps us from seeing clearly. They would not, they could not. They were either in or they were out. Because the stakes were high and you were reduced mostly, mostly to understanding that life was only about what Jesus wanted for you. Now, he still had people who were business people. He had some wealthy women that helped fund his ministry, and we could go on with that. So there's, But most of these New Testament people, they were stripped of any pride in their life. If they were having a problem of looking bad in the community, losing their business, or even their life, then they just left the church. Today, our churches are and have been for too many decades now trying to placate to a Christian audience that wants half entertainment and half comedy and all that with some truce and some Jesus put in there. Just let that sink in. But you'll see the big picture as Jesus works on your vision. And the closer you get to Jesus, the more you'll see that big picture. The third bullet point there is my vision gets clearer my vision gets clearer and that's that third word clearly that I pointed out to you she had opened restored and clearly no cloudy vision no corrupted vision when Jesus takes over your life you get a focus a framework and a foresight that enables you to function in a healthy and mature way but until you let Jesus take over your life then you are only agitating yourself and you're close enough to the action to get splattered on of the blessings of God. They splatter on to you. But you're not really washed in his blessings because you're kind of standing away. You don't, you're afraid to let Jesus take over your life and what that would mean. What you need to do is pray Job's prayer in Job 34, 32. Teach me what I cannot see. And if I've done anything wrong, I will not do it again. I love that. Teach me what I cannot see. Today, I've got as good a viewpoint of what God wants to do in my life, my family, this church, our school, as anybody on this campus or listening today on the live stream. And yet... I pray, God, help me, teach me what I cannot see because my vision is still limited or has its limitations in the natural. I need divine spiritual wisdom and vision. Do you understand? All right, so let's go to number three, which is really brief. How can I see Jesus how I see Jesus determines how clearly I see everything else. Do not, because it's the last, let this blow over. It's not a, just a thrown-in statement. How I see Jesus determines how clearly I see everything else. How long you've been at CLC doesn't determine. How much money you give doesn't determine. How many scriptures you know doesn't determine. How many good works you do doesn't determine it. How... You and I see Jesus determines how clearly we see everything else. Matthew chapter 8, verse 27, 29. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Caesarea Philippi was only about 25 miles from Bethsaida where all this began. And if Jesus is not God, then we should close up shop and go home. But if he is God... Listen very carefully if you call yourself a Christian today. If he is God, 
He deserves our love, our trust, and our total obedience, even when it doesn't make sense. When we take communion in just a moment, that's what communion is really all about. Because He is our Lord, and we trust Him, we love Him, and we obey Him. And even when He takes my hand and says, follow me, and I have no idea where He's taking me, those things still apply. And it's never too late for Jesus to correct your vision. If today you can't see your way clearly, then let Jesus take your hand and lead you to the miracle that you need. I've never had a miracle that I received flippantly. Every miracle I received, I was desperate for God to move. I needed help that no man could give me. He would use people to help me get to the miracle. And then I took his hand and let him lead me. And I trusted him even when I could not see. You must do the same thing or you'll never get that miracle. It isn't a matter. I hate to put it this way. I don't even want to put it that way. It doesn't matter how desperately you need that miracle. What matters is what I just told you today. If you want a miracle, this is how God works in his people. I want you to take your communion if you would, please. Hopefully you can get that bread out. With Please take the bread out before you take the lid off of your juice. One day I lost my presence of mind and did that, and I'm on the stage and I'm like, this is awkward. How am I going to do this? Communion. Now next month in December, I'm going to preach a very special communion message on that uh, in November, I mean. In November, the last Sunday in November. And then I have surgery. I assume. I mean, who knows? Water lines can break. See, they don't know it, but that was a miracle I needed. We did not plan this well. We'd have been a mess with Marcia the way she was and then me with the way I'd be. And so when the gal called me the after, late afternoon of the morning before, I said, yes! And she was literally taken aback, I could tell. And she said, wow, you're the first person that hadn't been angry with me today. I said, oh, this was an answer to prayer. I don't know if it's a miracle, miracle, but I took it as one. Let's stand and... We all know that the bread represents the body of our Lord that was crucified for our sins. This juice represents his blood that was shed. We know that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this congregation, those that have been listening to this message today in person here or online. I pray that if they are in a position right now, they're ready to make a decision to follow you, that they will do that right where they are. After we're done here, may they come forward and one of our prayer partners or myself, I'll be glad to talk with them and pray with them. Those online, finding someone they can talk to there. But right now, may those people receive you into their heart and their life. Ask you to forgive them of their sins and make you Lord over their life. Not just their Savior, but understand that true Christianity, true salvation involves us making him Lord of our life. I pray your blessings on our time here as we partake of the bread and the juice together. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take the bread? Praise the Lord. This is a very sacred thing we do. We do it with regularity. We do it with almost routine, not receiving it routinely, but what we do is what we do. 
but it is very important. As we leave today, you here in the building, you watching online, let's get a miracle this week, sincerely. I've been where you are. You're crying. You're, you're, you're just in need of a miracle. You're just in need of a miracle. Whatever area of your life it is, let's get that miracle this week. If you need to go home, review the notes. Let's get that miracle, all right? God bless you. Have a good day. We'll see you next week.